Anybody know this song we're about to sing? Is that a yes? No, no, it's a no. no. Okay, okay. Who does know this song other than me? Okay, we've got a few people. Uh, you might also know that this, this song, song is actually longer than long what's printed here. We're not going to do the full version. For this very reason, maybe a lot of people don't know it, but it seems to tie in the right theme tonight. So we'll just do our best. Here's what we're going to do tonight, okay? okay? We're going to sing by the left. And that is just open up a letter fly. Whatever comes out, that's okay. That's all we've got. Here we go. Here we go. Let's see if you keep going. So, uh, so we didn't go before, and of course we found out it was true. And 
it's like wow, wow. no kidding. And then you're faced with chemotherapy, and you're faced with radiation, and, yeah. and, and all the trappings that come, come with it. And I remember I asking her after she didn't lose her hair, 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 and he said, yeah. 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 And you know, there was you know, something, something about, about us in our, in our, in our history, in our right? Because right. this happens when we were at the Coral Springs Church. And so, and so early on early in our time, when we first we arrived at Coral Springs in 1995, we were part of what they do every year called Bethlehem. They build the city of Bethlehem. Yeah. 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 And we were, we were they thrust they us in there the first year. They said, listen, we can this Bethlehem. I've never seen anything like that. And it was amazing. So we get thrown in and they dress. I mean, they try to replicate the day. Exactly. And they keep and they people in character. character. Exactly. exactly. Don't mess Don't up mess the moment. moment. So we were so there the first year, we thrust in, into, into it. And women, women are not allowed to show their hair. Right? Right? So it's your face, face, face like here, here with the covers. And you've right. seen pictures, pictures of women and women. And that's the way they look. And I remember and saying to my wife, my wife, I can sit where I'm standing on the walkway, right outside the office. And I said to her, it's a good thing, Julie, you and I didn't meet over in the Middle East. Right? And she goes, Jeff, yeah, why? And I said, you don't look cool with that. Who am I to talk, right? Yeah, yeah, I just did about hair last year. But, but, you know, it's just, it changes your appearance, right? right. And then all of a sudden, sudden, I find out she's going to lose her hair. And I went, and I went, I can't believe I say this. And so I asked her, do you remember me saying that to you? And she said, yeah, I said, just kidding, it was a joke, okay, it was a joke, joke. I don't mean it. But how traumatic was that? We were prepared, we thought it, until she was in the shower, and all of a sudden, all the punch was coming. And that was hard to part of going through that time. And that's just part of it, right? The vanity that we have in our lives because we want to look a certain way. Yeah, she got wigs, and you know what? We found out we are hot. And this is a hot place for these people, right? right? So after a while, I said, she, she wore straw hats. I said, if you want to ditch the hat, I don't care. She said, it's OK, OK. <laughs> one day, one day, she was in the she store was with her. She wasn't wearing a hat. Somebody tapped on her shoulder from the back and said, excuse me, sir, sir. And, I said, oh. and she goes, she goes, yes. <laughs> and thrust her chest and chest and chest and chest and so we had some fun, right? So it was so okay to look at it from a different perspective. But let me tell you, tell you that changed the situation. And I remember and I telling remember Julie, 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 this is your story, it's not mine, not mine. But when, but when she, she wanted people, people to know, so people would pray for her, uh, we, we let them work out. And I remember I thinking, remember thinking man, I've got some good things. Good thing. Let me do let the chemo for, for you so you don't have to do it. But you know what I tell her? I can't fix that. It's her disease. It's her disease. She's the one that's got to do the key to Wow. Wow. Tough days. Tough days. So three were threats to what I said. Praying for Ray Frazier. Frazier. And she continues to use her chemotherapy treatment. treatment. Praying too Praying for, for, for Colleen and Carla. As she continues to battle her cancer. her cancer. And then the one for healing, the healing of, the heart, of the heart. From, heart. from Peggy Cook. Peggy Cook. Over losing our daughter. daughter. Our only child, child, child ovarian cancer. Oh, wow. I don't I know, don't know what that's even going to be. You know, having okay. more than one, one child ourselves, ourselves. Um, I, I can't imagine can't just having one child and then losing them before I die. Because that's not that's what I'm supposed to have. The natural, the natural order, order is that parents die with five children. children. That's just the way it's supposed to be. And then when that gets turned upside down, down something is radical. radical. And all we can all do is be with people, people and yeah. love them, love them, and listen to them. to them. But it's hard to know what that's like. Also, also praying, praying for, for this church. church. And it said, this for, said your your leadership. for your leadership. Fred, 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 I think that was pointed to you. you. The email came, came to you. To you. So praying for your leadership and for the leadership of all of you who are. Steering this program 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 together. Prayers that people, people will continue to wear masks and social distance during these COVID days. My wife has become the 
self-appointed COVID watcher. I don't know why that is. Every every day. It's like yeah, it's like yeah, they're still going up. So we had a conversation around that, trying to trying to you know tamp that down, but because she is immune compromised, it's problematic for her. You see, she's not here again tonight. She would love she to would be love here. She she loves this love church. church. She loves she you. Loves you. But, but she just she doesn't, doesn't want to take want that chance. chance. And maybe, maybe you've, you've seen people, people out without masks. Without masks. Uh, we've, uh, we've seen some. Seen some. You know, and, and, and it's like, it's like I, I don't want to get beat up you know, because I said to somebody, hey, buddy, you just wear a mask. Come on, be a smart person. But it's amazing. So we hope people will wake up and say that's the right thing to do. Uh, prayers for God's protection, protection for all of us as we go through, through unprecedented times. Don't, don't you know? In all of our hearts, we've not seen it this before. <coughs> Praying for Pray the little walkers, walkers, walkers early learning center. center. Oh, yes. They are in a dispute and face eviction from Christ's church. <coughs> Praying for God's <coughs> will to be done. And I don't know. You know, I, I wonder about that whole God's will. Right? I've got questions about that. I want God's, I want God's will. God's, God's, God's will ultimately, 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 ultimately will be done. Doesn't mean it'll be done in this situation. Okay? Because there's a lot of stuff going on in the world that's not God's will. Now, God ultimately wins. Guess what? We've read the end of the story. We know how it ends. We know we know it ends. But it may not happen in our life. Certainly, it's only going to happen. Here's a, an interesting, interesting, I don't know if it's a prayer request or a question. Thank God I finally, finally have, have a new cell phone. phone. And that I and finally was able to get it activated at a Verizon store and not by a tech coach called the phone. <laughs> yeah, because you may be talking to somebody you can't understand. Anybody? 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 Anybody?
so that when our days are coming to an end, when they say to us, well done, well done good and faithful servant, come into the place that is prepared for you, that we, that we leave this earth with no regrets of our spot, having experienced the fullness of life that you have in store for us. And, our, and our, we would echo that for request for us for healthy days as well, as well, to be as healthy as we possibly can. Oh God, for the, for the COVID-19 that's going on in our midst. There are some people who don't seem to be taking it as serious as we ought to. And we pray that we would be patient with those who maybe aren't quite in the know like we are. But we know if you just speak the words, oh God, it would be gone as far as the east is from the west. And for reasons that we don't understand, it's here amongst us. And so we'll do our part to stay as safe as we possibly can. And we do pray for those first responders, those who are on the front line of this pandemic, those who are dealing with it because it's work-related for them. And there have been many, oh God, who have died because of trying to give service to those who were sick with it too, and then they got it. And that just seems so wrong, yet it happens even in our midst. So we just come before you and say, oh God, if you would heal our land, we will just come before you and bow the knee before you and humble ourselves and ask you to do a great thing in our time, these unprecedented times that we have not seen in our lifetime. Make your presence known among us, oh God. We pray too for the little walkers and whatever is going on there for for many of us that don't know the fine, fine details and the minutia that's taking place there. But there's something that's ugly and not right. And we just pray that cooler heads would start to prevail, that we would see the right thing done because it's the right thing to do, and that you would be in the midst of even the finest details that are taking place as separation needs to happen here, that it would go in a godly fashion and bring honor and glory to you in all facets. And we're thankful for the lives that we have, oh God, for people around us who are not as fortunate as we are, who've been struck by that word of cancer. And there's other debilitating diseases too, oh Lord. Not one of us here tonight has doesn't know somebody who's got some serious illness that they're dealing with. And how can we best minister, O oh Lord, but to stand in the need of your grace and to be there for other people, to be a listening ear, to do whatever it is that you call us to do, to stand beside people, to be with them, to comfort them, to hear their cries, and to call out to you to pray on their behalf. But sometimes, oh God, the only thing we can think to say is, oh God. Yet your word is clear. You hear our grumblings, even when they're moans and things that can't even form words. Your spirit interprets for us. So you know exactly what's on our lips. The depths of our hearts, oh God, you understand. So we do pray for those who are around us. And we want to be used by you, oh God, in a way that further your kingdom work, that we can be a blessing to someone else. Just use us. That would be our prayer, oh God. So come, Holy Spirit, be with us. Unite us as a people that are set apart to do your kingdom work. And we pray all of this in the holy and precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that same one who taught us all to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. And our birthday boy comes to lead us in Scripture. You all have excellent voices. <laughs>
lesson comes from the book of Proverbs, 15th chapter, verses 15, 16, and 17. All the days of the afflicted are evil, but he who is of a merry heart has a continual feast. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure with trouble. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a fatted calf with hatred. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Bill. You're welcome. Anybody look at the sermon title for tonight? Thanksgiving 365. What do you think of when you think of Thanksgiving? Uh, what's that? Beans. Beans? Beans. 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 There we go. Uh, I just need to unplug my ears and we'll be fine, right? It's a feast, right? It's that day, that Thursday, near the end of uh, November. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, near the end of that month, where we set it aside. And here comes the turkey and the dressing, and don't ever forget the cranberries. I love cranberry sauce, right? And it's the mashed potatoes and the yams and the green bean casserole and the pumpkin pie. And woo, what a day. Don't we eat too much on Thanksgiving Day? We tend to sometimes, but we always want to save the leftovers. There's got to be some leftovers. Does anybody make a turkey sandwich and put uh, cranberry sauce on it? Oh, man. I, I waited way too late in life to discover that. That's a, that's a winner right there. So, yeah, the leftovers is the best part. But we hear this scripture tonight, and it's about Thanksgiving. Not about Thanksgiving today, Thanksgiving Day. Although Irma Bombeck, you may remember her, an excellent writer, she said this, I come from a family where gravy is considered a beverage. <laughs> that's perfect for that Thanksgiving feast. But Thanksgiving isn't just one day of the year. It's something that we ought to experience every day of the year. So that's what this is all about. And in fact, see if you can figure out where this quote came from. We must find time to stop and thank the people who make a difference in our lives. And you'd have to go back, oh, well over 50 years ago. That was John F. Kennedy Jr., our president. No, John F. Kennedy. He's the one who made the statement. But we could go to a theologian by the name of Charlie Brown who said this, what if today you are grateful for everything? Amen. Yeah, that's a good word, right? What if today we were grateful for everything? So I chose Solomon's words here. Solomon was the writer of the Proverbs. He was also the writer of the Song of Songs, sometimes called the Song of Solomon, as well as the book of Ecclesiastes was considered at the time to be the smartest man who had ever lived. So he brings us this word, and it's about living in a continual feast that every day we can experience that very thing. Well, how do we do it? He gives us three verses about that. The first is this. Fill your mind with integrity. Fill your mind with integrity. He said this. The cheerful heart has a continual feast. A continual feast. It's a daily thing. It just keeps happening. You may be familiar with that computer term from years ago, garbage in, garbage out, right? Whatever you put in is what's going to come out of it. So our minds are much the same way. In fact, if we go a few chapters ahead of where we're reading in Proverbs, Solomon writes this in Proverbs 23, 7. For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Oh, boy, those are some tough words to hear, right? As you think, you are. So let's put our mind in a different place, in a sense of integrity. When we do with that, that changes everything. Years ago, many years ago, it was 1981-82. I took a year out of ministry in an effort to uh, fix some things in my life, and so I stepped away from ministry for that one year. And when I did, 
Uh, the economy wasn't good at that time, so I did, did various sales jobs. Lots of sales jobs available. If you didn't sell anything, they didn't pay you. So no skin off their nose. They'll hire anybody off the street. And I worked for New York Life for a period of time. And when we learned our presentation, how we go to somebody and make a presentation, part of what they taught us was this thing called PMA. And I don't know if you've heard of that before, but it's called, that's the acronym for Positive Mental Attitude. PMA, so you come into the meeting, you know, we're all together, hey, PMA, yeah, PMA. And it's not this idea in theology where we say name it and claim it, but it's a little bit different than that. It's this idea that before you go to make a presentation to someone, get your attitude right. Get in the right place, in the right frame of mind before you ever get there. That doesn't necessarily mean you're going to make a sale, but it will sure make a far better presentation, and it might just be the thing that throws the switch for you. Get yourself grounded. Get in the right place. Get your mind settled before you go. What a novel idea that is. PMA for everybody. Positive mental attitude. Well, actually, Paul wrote about that in the book of Philippians. Philippians 4, 8. But he said it this way, and this comes from the Amplified Bible. So the Amplified Bible puts a few extra words in there to make it come alive a little bit more. And he says this, Finally, believers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable and worthy of respect, whatever is right and confirmed by God's Word, whatever is pure and wholesome, whatever is lovely and and brings peace, whatever is admirable and of good repute, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think continually on these things. Center your mind on them and plant them in your heart. I mean, you get that? Wow. Things that are excellent and praiseworthy. Boy, like a laser focus. Get on that and get it in your mind. Do you think that'll make a difference in your life? Oh, wow. You bet it will. Thanksgiving, all of a sudden we see things from a different perspective. These days, some people would say, just turn the news off for a while and live life, right? So start with, fill your mind with integrity. The second thing he would bring to us is fill your heart with faith. Fill your heart with faith. In fact, verse 16 says this. Better a little fear of the Lord than great wealth with turmoil. Better a little fear of the Lord. This doesn't mean we cower down and we're afraid of God. No, it means reverence, to have a sense of reverence for God, to fear Him in that sense. And when you see it from that perspective, you say, oh, I get it, to have reverence for God. Better more of that than some sense of turmoil. Do you notice how he juxtaposes one thing against another, saying, well, you can have reverence for the Lord, or you can have great wealth and turmoil. Well, that's problematic. So, gee, it could be one or the other. And you know what? In life, we find some things are better than other things. In our marriage vows, what do we say? For better or worse? For richer or poorer? In sickness and in health? Anybody want sickness? Hmm. Richer or poorer? I'll go with richer. Uh, we see we have choices that happen in our lives. And we say yes to that. In fact, I did a wedding in Coral Springs. And I talked about this in one of my worship services. You've got to watch where you're telling stories, right? Because you may forget what had happened. But I was doing this wedding at a country club. And with a couple there. And there was a massive amount of people. It was a big wedding. And it was the bride's turn to repeat after me. And I said, for richer, for poorer. And she said, for richer? She never said poor. And everybody busted out laughing. And in my heart of hearts, I thought, you know what? I think she means it. <laughs> I don't think she's kidding. Now, granted, we all want richer. But I really felt like she was saying, yeah, we're not doing poorer in this house. You got it? Husband of mine or husband to be? I really felt like she meant it. And so I told that story to my 
Coral Springs congregation, and they laughed too. They thought it was funny. Right after the service, a woman comes up to me and said, I know whose wedding that was. I said, you do not. <laughs> oh, yes, I do. I said, you do not. We went back and forth with that until she said, it was my son. I went, oh, yes, it was. <laughs> I'm so sorry. She said, it's OK. I felt the same way you do. I said, oh, OK. Whew, whew. Watch when you tell stories, right? But we have choices in our lives. And here, what he's saying is, you know what? Wealth does not bring some panacea. Just because we have wealth, it doesn't mean all of a sudden, great, all of our troubles go away and life is going to be a bowl of cherries. I don't think so. There are people who have plenty of money that get divorced. There's people who have plenty of wealth that have children that are out of control. There are people with plenty of wealth that have issues. So they don't go away just because we might have extra dollars in our bank account that somebody else doesn't have. It's not a panacea like that. In fact, I've had people over the years that have said to me, if I win the lottery, <laughs> that's a great plan for financial success, right? My, my retirement, what's your retirement plan? Winning the lottery? OK, well, you're in trouble, right? That is not a retirement plan. But they would say, if I ever win the lottery, the money is going to the church. It's like, OK, that never happened in my 47 years of ministry. Never had anybody win the lottery and give the money to the church. It sounds nice, but you've heard the stories of people who win the lottery, and their life isn't exactly a bowl of cherries, right? It's problematic because all of a sudden, everybody comes after them, and life is not so happy. Well, is a relative term. I want you to know I'm a wealthy man. And no, that doesn't mean my bank account has a gazillion dollars in it. I'm wealthy because I've got a fairly new car. I've got a roof over my head, a condo that's filled with furniture. I've got a comfortable bed to sleep in every night. I've got a refrigerator and a freezer full of food as well as a pantry. You know what? I'm not hurting for anything in this life. I've got a wife who loves the Lord and who loves me. Man, I can't be any wealthier. It doesn't get any better than that. So when we look at what he's telling us here, wealth is a relative term. Maybe you're a wealthy person too. Not by the world's standards, but by God's standards. Our church at Coral Springs took several mission trips to Honduras. I was able to go with them one time, but on one particular trip, I wasn't there. And they went to a couple orphanages. They had one for girls that was separate from the one for boys. The boys lived on a farm, tended the farm, and the animals took care of them, and they also produced some of the food they ate. But it was at the farm where some of our young people were. They were so touched by what they saw because these people, you know what the, the game is they play in Honduras? Soccer. That is the game for them. And they would play, and I saw them, on their soccer field, which was a dirt and rock field. That was it. Nothing that we would be satisfied playing on, but boy, they were happy as a lark, and their ball was terrible. But it worked for them. Because you know what? They just said, this is fine. This is what we have. And yet, they admired what our kids from America wore when they were there. They go, wow, that's a nice t-shirt. And I like your shorts or your, your, your jeans or whatever they were wearing. And all of our kids, without exception, came back from that mission trip with empty suitcases. Oh. Because they were so touched, they said, here, take my stuff. It's just stuff. Doesn't matter. Take my stuff. I'll get more of them. So we see what happens in our lives when we look from a different perspective. Paul also put it this way in Philippians 4.12, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Paul's on to something. We learn how to live with what God's given to us. And let me tell you, I feel blessed to be in the position I am. Well, we fill our mind with integrity, fill our heart with faith, 
And finally, to fill our home with love. He said this, better a meal of vegetables where there is love than a fat calf with hatred. And if you read the Message Bible, I like the way they put it there. They said, better a bread crust shared in love than a slab of prime rib shared in hate. <laughs> yeah. And I love prime rib. But not when you're in a hateful situation. It just doesn't taste good that way, right? Have you ever been around somebody that has been in a tough, tough battle all their lives? And for whatever reason, they just seem to be on top of it that they can't be beaten down by their circumstances. And I've seen people like that, and I'm amazed by what I see. People whose faith goes so deep, and they have such love for God, that the things of this world, the exterior, doesn't seem to matter. I had a man in my church in Hollywood that passed away several months ago, and I came back to be a part of the service. And Fred was a submariner, back in World War II, and so he served his time on a submarine. And he was a great man who loved God, but he knew his time was coming, and he, we talked about it. I'd go to the house, and we would just share things back and forth. And he would tell me all kinds of stories. He said, Larry, I'm ready. I can't wait for the day when Jesus calls me home. Even though he had cancer, and he said, I know what it's going to be like, but I'm ready. And I hope the day when God calls me home that I'll have that same attitude, ready to go on. God, it's okay. I've done all I need to do here. Bring me home. We'll look forward like that. You may know the story of Lou Gehrig. Oh yeah, that one called the Iron Man, played for the New York Yankees first base for many years. Set the record at the time for playing the most consecutive games without missing. Never sick until one day when he didn't go out on the field. And there was a murmur in the stands. What's going on? What's happening? until he came out in front of a microphone that they sat down right there in front of home plate. And he talked to the crowd. Very famous speech. And yet he had to announce what had happened. He had ALS, which we now call Lou Gehrig's disease because it was his disease. And if you know what that happens, what happens to people that have that, I've seen it. And it's terrible, and it's debilitating, and you get to the point where all of a sudden you're in a wheelchair, and none of your muscles are working right, and then it finally affects up here where you can't even swallow anymore. And it's a horrible, horrible death. But he came out to that microphone, and he said, while I may have been dealt a bad blow, I consider myself to be the luckiest man who ever lived. Wow. That's the way I want to be. In fact, I feel like the luckiest man who's ever lived. Everything been great in my life? No, but I'm the luckiest man. Now we can trade stories, right? We can duke it out for who has the luckiest life. But God has smiled on me, and I want to give my best back to him. Because you know what? Thanksgiving is a choice. It's a choice. We can choose if we want to have a Thanksgiving every day to feast continually. It's our choice. What will you choose? The Bible says this. Choose life. Choose life that you may live. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you for the gift that comes to us through Jesus Christ, who gives us real life. And oh God, for that life that we have, it's more than we can comprehend, more than we can ever understand that you would go to the cross for us. And yet, if you had to do it again, you would even if I was the last person on earth. I thank you, God, for that sacrifice that you've made, and may I turn back to you and give you my absolute best each and every day. Come before you with thanksgiving in my heart. Receive me this day as your disciple. We pray through Christ our Lord and Savior. Amen. When you came in tonight, you should have received a package that looks exactly like this. So if you have that, I invite you to take it out right now. Well, remember, it was 
just a regular meal. It was a Passover meal. Nothing unusual about it that Jesus was sharing with his disciples. And he took something as ordinary as the bread that was on the table before him. And that's what he chose to break. And made that statement to his disciples. This represents my body that's broken for you. That every time you would eat this, you'd remember me. And there was a cup on the table before him. And he lifted it up. And after he'd given thanks to God, he said, This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, he said in remembrance of me. And I'm sure those first disciples didn't get what was going on there, what was really taking place. But now, 2,000 years later, we can look back and say, yes, I see that, and I get that. So we have that opportunity to share in that same year. This is the body of Christ, which is broken for you. I invite you to take and eat in remembrance of Jesus Christ. This is the cup of salvation poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. And I believe the word was put them back in a plastic bag, the leftover cup, and we'll collect those on your way in. Let us pray together. O oh Lord, we recognize we are not worthy to gather the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose property is always to have mercy. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father, and watch over us, O oh God, as we truly seek to be your disciples and follow your ways. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Well, you may have noticed there was a hymn at the... Uh, at the end of the bullet, did anybody see that? I just ran right through it and didn't, didn't even do it. So uh, my bad for that, because I was going to put it at the end of the message. Anybody know this song, I'd Rather Have Jesus? Yes. No? Yes. Yes? But there are some no's in the room, right? So, okay, well, we're going to do our best with that real quick, okay? Because it's just one verse of this song, because I was trying to tie it in to the message. And I don't know about you, I'd rather have Jesus than anything else. So, we sing together. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be there than precious untold. Thank you. <laughs> I'd rather
receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace as part of his purpose and his power to not only live as his disciples each day, but to live a thanksgiving and that continual feast through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And Fred, will you come and bring us home? Thank you, Larry. You know, I just want to update everybody on some of the things that are happening. Can you all hear me if I just stand here? Yeah, but you can use this part. Can you hear me now? Yeah. One of the things that uh, has been a true blessing in my life, and I think in the life of all the people here, uh, is this man sitting right back here. Yeah. Yeah. About five months ago, I got a call and uh, from a pastor, a Methodist pastor, and he said, you know, I know what you're doing, Fred. I believe in what you're doing, and I really want to help. I think there's a pastor who's retired that you may want to talk to. I've spoken to him, and he said he would help you a little bit. And we had lunch, and it was Larry. And about 30 seconds into the lunch, I knew that Larry and I had a lot in common. It was just easy to talk to him. It was easy to uh, have a message. He was uh, right on theologically with uh, what we're doing and was willing to step out of his comfort zone and help us. And that's been five months ago. Uh, we truly have been blessed more than I would ever have imagined. One of the things that guides my life is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit says to me, I'm going to open up some doors, or I'm going to close some doors, depending on uh, if you're following the path that I would like you to do. I have never been involved in 45 years of following Jesus where the path has been stronger than this one. It just seems like doors that would never open, doors that didn't even know were there, have been opened, and we are sitting here tonight, and we're blessed. Uh, many people that have watched what we're doing are actually doing it on the west coast of the United States. Uh, they're doing it, it's a movement almost, that a lot of people, because of COVID, because of the general conference lasting a uh, whole year and a half from now, uh, are started doing what we're doing. It's been a real warm time. Uh, Pastor Larry has given us his season and uh, is now needing to step away and uh, his last service will be on July 4th. Oh. So we want to thank him for everything he's doing. Is it scary to go on without Pastor Larry? Yes, yes. yes it is. <laughs> uh, but God, we have a big God. Yes. And without any of us, God can get it done. Uh, we feel a calling to keep this mission going. I'm going to explain in a few minutes some of the things that have happened since Pastor Larry gave me that news. But I'm going to give him a chance to talk with you. Thank you, Fred. Uh, we were talking after um, one of our recording sessions, and Fred said to me, I need to talk to you because, as you know, the general conference was postponed and put off for some time from now. What we thought was going to be happening in July now is 14 months away from now. And it's like, wow, who saw that coming other than nobody? So it was this idea that, you know, when I was first called, it's like, well, if I can help out, because, yeah, the idea was, let's become a traditional United Methodist Church that will get an appointed pastor from the traditional grouping that's part of the Florida Conference. That's how it's supposed to work and how it was going to work. And so it was like, yeah, can I step in and, and help out for a while? Sure. So then Fred said, well, going forward, I don't think, he says, we need something for about the next 14 months now to get us to that point. What part do you want to play in that? Do you, uh, you know, from zero to 100, where do you want to be in that? And I said, well, Fred, it's, um, you know, I, I'm trying to be retired. I, I said to the conference at the retirement ceremony two years ago, I said, yeah, you'll find us on the beach. We haven't made it to the beach yet in two years. We're still trying to get there. We can't see that. That's not your fault or anything like that, but 
retirement hasn't exactly been retirement. And I love doing this, and my wife will tell you that um, if somebody asks me to do something within the realm of the church, I always say yes. And that's just kind of my nature, and partly because I love doing this as well. And we have loved being with you all. This has been terrific. But I, I know there's some talk, and it's on the sheet, about a Saturday or a Sunday worship. And we're kind of tied into Cokesbury United Methodist Church. We attend there on Sundays, and, and I'm helping them out with their praise band and mentoring the pastor there. So we kind of have some roots in there. Even though we'd like to be here too, it's like, well, if they're both Sunday morning, that's kind of a problem. So um, it, it's just at this point, as we're trying to move forward, it's like, okay, this might be the break time to move into a transition of some sort to move you toward the goals you're trying to get to that'll make it better for you all. It's been a blessing for, for us and for me to be with you. I mean, I, do you know how many uh, how many times I've preached to you yet? I had to count it up because I wasn't even sure, but I think it's like 16. And I, I thought, really, it's been that many? And it has been. And uh, amazing how time flies and gets kind of biased like that. But, but it's really been that. So it's, uh, but it's been a, a, a great ride for us. And we've got two more weeks together, OK? So, uh, so we're going to be there. And yes, you have a future. Whoever is in this role is just a person, okay? And God's got somebody in store for you because there's a future out there with a younger pastor than me who can take it and say, let's go. Let's get the vision. Let's see where God is moving. Let's join God in that mission. And boy, let's see what God's going to do. Because as Fred said, doors got open here. Unbelievable. Never saw this coming. And so here we are here. Is this the future? God only knows, right? But we shall see what the future is. So Fred's got some more plans that he wants to share with the rest of you. Thank you, Larry. I guess we'll that's going to take half an hour. And he better come these next two weeks, too. <laughs> the 4th of July was going to be a problem, I can tell you. And Larry's, I guess I can tell this, Larry, Larry and his wife talked about that and because we talked a month ago about a drop dead date of July 1st, and uh, both Julie and he said, you know, I'll do the 4th. So, oh. this is kind of sad. <laughs> Not easy to get to I wanted to hand out this um, handout that you folks have got. For, for one thing, I want to be extremely transparent. I don't want anything to be unknown. So I'm trying to lay out to everybody, because there is no, nobody designated me as any kind of leader here. It's just a, I stood up at the right time, this is the season, and I'm here for, uh, for God. And, and actually, number one is talking about that. For me, it's a kingdom issue. It didn't start off as a kingdom issue. It started off as leaving Christ Church and trying to do a traditional following. You know, we had 125, 150 people that came to me as a lay pastor and as a council chair, and they said, what are we going to do? You know, this is not good. And so that's what I started at. But as time has gone by and the months have gone by and the Holy Spirit has been talking to me, for me, it's a kingdom issue. What do I mean by that? I mean that Christianity, for me, is going this way. And it, I'm talking worldwide. I'm talking about the challenges of accepting Jesus. I'm talking about Christianity itself. And are we going to change the world? No, probably not. But this is our little domain down here in Briar County, Florida. And for me, it's more than just the West Van Fellowship Group. It's all about keeping Jesus front and center, biblical truth, staying true to our true to the Word of, of God. And so I'm I'm marching on with that in mind. It doesn't mean that everybody in this room has to have that vision. You know, there's a lot of people that just want a traditional worship. I'm fine with that. You know, if you're coming here because you want to hear true biblical worship, that's what we're trying to offer. And if that's where God's calling you and that's all you feel like you've got right now, you don't have to fight this worldly battle. Uh, so I just wanted you to know you'll be hearing and seeing me do things. You say, what the heck's he doing that for? Why is he talking the, about the uh, Western Covenant Association and, and the worldwide meeting and the, the, the uh, general conference in 14, 15 months and what's happening to the Methodist Church in the meantime? The reason is 
Because for me, it's a kingdom issue. It's not just the Western Fellowship Group. But I just wanted you to know that. Um, number two is 15 to 24 months. We started this thing thinking that we would stay in here till May 5th, and then the church would split, and we would join a new denomination. We would be like a charter church for a new traditional Methodist denomination, whatever that looked like. And that was the reason why Pastor Larry stepped forward. And that two months, three months, that turned into really 15 to 24 months. There's some that will say this will take us two years before we actually have a, a separated church that we can join. So that changes things a little bit. This is, that's the reason why I keep, I'm now using the word church. I was using worship and fellowship and all that before. Frankly, we're a church. And so here we are. We're marching forward. Those that want to stay that way and want to keep with us, praise the Lord. But I think it's time for us to realize what, we, what the mission that is in front of us, and I think it's a challenge. We're going to have to meet that challenge if we want to end up 24 months from now being a charter uh, traditional Methodist denomination. And that's my call. That's what I feel called to do. I think most of you feel the same way. Number three was church-wide voting on everything. Um, one of the reasons why we're standing here right now it's because a lot of us felt like we didn't get that. Uh, I, would, I, I will say right now, that I will leave if that isn't the case. Because we have to be, everybody here has to make decisions. I would love to be the dictator, or a dictatorship if I was a dictator. Mm -hmm. But that's not the way it is. We're all going to vote, and we're going to vote on as many things as we can. We probably won't vote on uh, what the bulletin looks like, but we will vote on all the big issues that, are, that confront us. And you'll see in this next grouping, there's some things I want to vote on right now. So we'll be doing that. And you can, any one of you that's sitting here, or anyone that hears this message online, because we're going to post this, um, call me up. If there's something that we're doing that we're not voting on, and you didn't have a say in, uh, if not if you agree or disagree, it doesn't make any difference. We will vote. And I have no problem with that. Number four is uh, election of representatives. Uh, we probably won't call it a council member. <laughs> but it was apropos. We'll come up with another name for uh, six, eight, ten, whatever we want to do. People that we as a congregation vote to be leaders for us to make more of the small day-to-day -day type decisions and things that it takes to run a church. And the way that would work is that we need to elect those people. So I envision that we will send us all out, we'll take a deep breath, we'll talk about it, and we will see who wants to step up, who offers to step up. Right now we have what we call the steering committee, but the steering committee was never voted on. The steering committee was people who were willing to meet at a house on a Thursday night for a few weeks and try to get see what was going to happen and get it going. I love every one of them. I think they're leaders, they're true leaders. But that, that's not me to decide, that's us to decide. And there may be a season for them. There may be people that say, well, I was on the steering committee, but frankly, I don't have the time, or I don't have the energy, or that's not my calling. And, and plus, I don't. there's no formal steering committee. There might be 12, 15, 18 of us, whoever showed up at the house, they were, okay, you're on the steering committee. So we need to formalize that. And it doesn't have to be done tomorrow, but we do need to take a vote. So I'll probably in the next week or two be asking for people online. I'll probably say, if you feel called to serve a little more, uh, let me know. We'll put you on the list of uh, delegates or people that we would vote for, and we'll see who the congregation wants as the top six or eight or ten or you know, whatever we want to guide us as we move forward with this. Yeah, come on. How many uh, individuals would you be looking at in terms of serving as both the church representatives? I mean, what we, are we could even vote on that, but uh, you know, I think 12 is max for me. I, it's hard to make decisions if you get much more than that. I could go down as low as six or eight, but the problem is if you go to six and three aren't there, <laughs> then you're down to three. You know? So 12 is kind of a 10, 12 is a number that's in my head. Wow, because it's the disciples. The there you go. And what's the current number of individuals serving now on the council? Oh, sorry. Well, there, there is no correct committee. As you pointed out to me last week, I put you on the steering committee when I sent you an email, and you didn't even know it. Um, so uh, I would say the proper, most of the time, is 18 to 20. 
that uh, show up or have a voice that I send emails to. Uh, it's just that uh, when you start to make decisions with 10, 18, 18 or 20 people, it becomes a little unruly. And I love to do consensus. I hate votes. I hate winners and losers. But sometimes, you know, you got to take a vote. You know, you can't get around it. Um, openness and transparency on everything is my pledge to you. I, I probably am going to share more information than anybody you've ever known, probably more than I should, but I, I hate darkness. I hate when people don't know. And I think churches are kind of not just this current situation we're in, but I've, through the years I've seen churches be way too secret about things that are going on. And I don't have any reason to do that. If you call me up and ask me anything, I'm pretty well going to tell you. Even if it isn't general knowledge yet or hasn't been decided yet, I just love transparency. Because, as you know, uh, the light it sterilizes everything. Website. So um, we have a website. Uh, we haven't really officially launched it yet, but we, it's called uh, Church 360. It was uh, David United Methodist has that website, and several others do. The price seemed to be reasonable. Uh, Pastor Scott Didrickson loves it. Uh, we went down and met with one of his representatives today. Uh, and thank goodness for uh, Robert Becky, uh, Sherry Becky's son, because he's a guru. And in two hours, we put this thing together. And uh, give me another two or three hours, and Robert will have ourselves a good website going. So I plan on launching that pretty quick. Uh, we haven't even taken our first tutorial because he didn't need it. <laughs> he, he knew how to do it without that. We're going to upgrade our pictures and upgrade our serving uh, contacts and stuff like that so that it can be a full fledged one. It actually has three different functions. It has one called uh, members, one called, uh, help me with this, uh, Unite, which is actually the website itself, and one called Ledger. And Ledger is, uh, of course, the bookkeeping part of it. Members is quite extensive and it's good. And when we start this young, or this small, uh, we can put in, we have 140 names of people that have actually come to a service. So I'll be sending the members will be people who have attended service. If you don't, if you don't get, if you haven't given us an email, we need to have you in there. But we think we got almost everybody that has ever attended one of our 16 services. Yep. Uh, so, but I want to make sure that anyone that's attended gets a chance to vote, gets a chance to be called a member before I go on to the survey thing, is there any questions about that part? The part that I've talked to before? Well, you can think about it if there is, you know how to get a hold of me. Um, I was just more or less putting this stuff together. Now, on the survey, you, you have a couple of choices. I'm going to send this out online so you can wait and then circle stuff if you want to circle it right now. And you want to, it's going to be anonymous. I don't need anybody's name. But we have some decisions to be made. First of all, next week, We'll have a visitor, Eric Specken. Eric is a very successful, I call him young man, mid-40s, father of a couple of children. I don't know his whole demographic, but he's a very successful guy who has turned his life over to God and has uh, been two years at Knox Seminary. Uh, does not, is not ordained yet. But he was recommended to me. I went out and met him. He's a great guy. He wants to do it really bad. Um, right now, we have him penciled in for the three weeks of July. Uh, after the fourth. And I think I invited him to come next week to meet you all. And so we'll have a chance to meet him and see what you think. Uh, then probably the following week we'll have Pastor Brad Smith. Brad is a very successful, ordained pastor who started a church called City Church uh, several years back. They're very successful. Uh, that church uh, has got a lot to offer and there's some interesting things that they may be planning. They are mostly young families. We aren't. Uh, so it would be interesting to see if there's any commonality there that maybe we could jumpstart this thing. Pastor Brad is willing to help us with preaching, with music. It's a holistic church that's grown about 150 people. Right now they're worshiping at, I call it Second Pres, it's uh, got another name, but it's the one that's on Federal Highway. Sanctuary Church. They're, they are leasing space from them in the fellowship hall. Uh, they have to set up and tear down every week, and so they're looking for another place. I've known him through the years. 
I've known Brad a lot through the years. He was actually a board member in Hope South Florida, and he's very well respected around the, around Broward County. So he's going to come with me to student. Yes? Where I need to. Everybody has my YouTube whenever you want to. Just go to YouTube and type in City Church. Absolutely. 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 He, Absolutely great. Yes, his sermons. I think you'll like them. He's very good. Uh, yes, go on YouTube. Uh, with City Church, he has you know, weekly services that we can listen to. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. And then I think, that, like I said, he'll be good if he wants to meet you. Uh, there's some other possibilities for location. That's one of the reasons why I put down here. I need to know, I guess, and I'll let, to, I'll let you know what my feeling is. My feeling is, I love Saturday night. I don't think we can grow if we only do Saturday night. I've been told by many pastors recently and through the years that if you don't have a Sunday morning service, it's hard to grow. So I guess our option is stay at Saturday night, go to Sunday morning, or maybe try to do both. And you think, well, we aren't big enough to do both. And why can we do both? Um, I think it's up to God. People tell me that we're actually considered a medium-sized church now. Uh, <laughs> believe it or not. I, I call us a starting church, but they say anybody above 80 is a medium-sized church, 80 to 150, I think, 150 to 400 large. So I, I would like to know what you guys think. If we can, if we can work it and to meet on a Sunday, are you willing? If we, if you're not, and you want to stay with Saturday, we can do, do that. Um, I've been trying and talking to this church and with City Church and with Hope South Florida and about 10 other places that we might be able to worship on Sunday morning. Sunday morning is a little more problematic because pastors work on Sunday morning, so it's a little more difficult. But there is an opportunity for 9 o'clock in a couple of different places, including here. Music. So right now, um, we are blessed to have a guitar player that we're going to lose and a piano player, but we also have an opportunity to do uh, praise music, or hymnal music, or a combination of both. And uh, I'd love to have you circle whichever one of those you, you would prefer, and we'll see. Communion, do you want to do it every week? Do you want to do it the first of the month? It's been a topic of conversation. Let's, let's see where everybody sits on that one. Um, are you willing to travel to our own uh, venue for worship if it is north of Sunrise and east of I-95? So I want to okay. give you some, some parameter. What's that? A far north. Okay, we could say you know, not north of Atlantic. Well, unless maybe one block. No. <laughs> so, so uh, I wanted to give you. I mean, I wanted your opinion on uh, if we could stay in this general area within a couple of miles. Are you willing to do that? Because no. finding a place that we can do and have what I want to not lose is fellowship. I want to have a little more access to. Can we stay there? Can we have a Wednesday night Bible study? How about yes. youth groups? How about if we want to meet on Sunday morning? You know, are all those things open? And it's tough. It's tough to find a venue. So you can pray for us about that. But uh, that's one of the challenges we have. So those are the first questions I have that you can either circle right now and just hand them in as you go, or wait for me to email it out to everybody and see what the 140 people that's attended here kind of get a feel for where we are. Any questions? Let me close this with a prayer. Father, sometimes uh, we try to rely on these things ourselves and our shoulders get heavy and we, get, we really struggle and yet we know that's not right. Uh, we know that it's all about you. We know that your son came here and we can rely on Jesus and the Holy Spirit to guide us. So we're asking you not to do our will. We don't, we don't want to do our will. We want to do your will. So guide us and direct us as we pray about this, as we think about this, as we think bigger than ourselves. Think about people that we want to bring to us. Think about people that we want to open the doors for traditional Methodist worship. Think about people that are lost and don't know Jesus and are maybe uh, driven away from the church. Uh, help us be that kind of witness as we move forward. We will trust you to do this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.